Welcome to my podcast, Tales of a Death Doula. My name is Martha, and I am a certified death doula. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing tales and stories about my own personal journey uh, to become a death doula and to learn about the metaphysical studies that death teaches us about life. We'll be delving into topics of death and dying, of spirituality and metaphysics, of mystical experiences, and being a student of death to learn more about life. In this first episode of Tales of a Death Doula, let's begin from the beginning. My initiation into learning about death began back in 2012. In 2012, I was living in San Diego and I was working for a genetic research institute and learning all about DNA and RNA and genetic expressions and all these things that I had not studied. I was an English major in college, but they hired me in their marketing department to implement a new business process, a new way for their marketing team to do their projects. And so I became an agent of change. And as we know, agents of change often meet with resistance to change because it's many people in their very nature do not enjoy change and do not enjoy learning new ways to think about problems. So my days were filled with trying to uh, convince and uh, and, um, bring some level of uh, understanding to existing business processes and how we can change and and create a new way uh, to do their business. It was very taxing, very tiring, and people, as expected, didn't really like me in that position. I was changing the way they were doing their daily work, and they did not like that, and they voiced it on me. I became the uh, the persona of change and people didn't like me at that job and I was not happy. It was a very um, chaotic period in my life. During this time in 2012, um, I also um, was affronted with death. Death came knocking on my door. My ex-husband that I had divorced two years prior um, Uh, was a a controlling alcoholic and and the poor man just had a lot of issues and um, I decided to save myself and uh, and got out of that marriage and uh, divorced him knowing that I was probably leaving him to his fate and two years later in 2012 as I was working at this job that was so taxing and so hard on me I got a call from a police officer from the morgue saying that they had found my ex-husband who had uh, taken his life the long hard way. He, he, He was an alcoholic and drank himself to death. So death came knocking on my door and I would drive the long commute I had to drive from San Diego to Carlsbad for this job that I hated. And on that long commute, um, several mornings I would just have to pull over and cry because even though I had such resentment and I really had a lot of hatred and anger about how that relationship had unfolded, realizing the finality of death and how somebody that you truly tried to love um, was no longer there was very difficult and very hard for me. So very dark time in my life. I would come home from this job that I hated after being emotionally um, confronted with death and thought about that on my commute every day, uh, driving there and driving back. And I would come home and there was an HBO series, um, it was a docu-series following people who had been gotten terminal diagnosis and it followed their progression of being diagnosed 
with illness and their progression towards death and how their families were dealing and preparing for the inevitable. And there was a lot of um, information that I hadn't thought about, about all the necessary preparations and things that you have to do, you should do before you die, uh, getting your, um, your will and advanced directives and all of these things that I had never thought about. Um, and it was a real eye-opening experience to kind of view on a TV screen what death looks like and what it really entails. And it was a third-party perspective viewpoint. I was just watching a TV show. But at that time, I was also talking to my parents who were retired in Dallas and my father was showing more signs of dementia and Alzheimer's and my mother was having a really hard time with it. She was um, having issues of, with her physical health while my father was having physical, was having mental um, problems and it was just so taxing and I would talk to them every day and then I would go to work and have this horrible, you know, work experience and come home and watch this very morbid show. And it was just death, 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 death. And I just decided I needed to leave that situation and move to Dallas and help my mom take care of my father. I had been watching the show about how hard it is to go through that death process. And so I did. I, I left San Diego moved to Dallas, moved in with my parents as an adult, moving in with your parents. <gasps> That's a whole transition experience right there. But I didn't have a job. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that that's what I needed to do. I needed to go and help my mother and my father transition into their own death experiences. And I did that. And I'm so very glad I did. It was the best decision I've ever made. Um, because uh, a few years later, um, I wound up getting a lovely job as a consultant in Dallas and uh, living downtown in a very nice, beautiful high-rise condo and just kind of living, living my life and moving on from all of the kind of morbid death experiences uh, that I had been living in San Diego. And... Uh, one Easter, my mother and I used to love to cook together. We were both Southern Southern women. We both loved to cook. And we were planning an Easter dinner party with their neighbors, my friends, everybody. We were going to have a house full of folks. And uh, I went over to their house on Good Friday before Easter. Um, this was 2016, so several years had passed. And mother wasn't doing very well with her health. She was starting to have some heart palpitations. She had been to the doctor that week and was scheduled to go to a cardiologist um, on Monday, right after Easter. And she wasn't feeling well. She was tired and looked, you could see the paleness in her, in her face. And we were making an apple pie together and mother was helping me chop the apples and we made the crust and the whole shebang. And we were making the apple pie and mom just did not look well. And I asked her to go and sit in the den with dad and just watch the news. I would finish the pie and get it in the oven. And I did that. And by the time I walked into the den, Mom and Dad were both snoring on the couch. Uh, <laughs> when you tell a 70-year-old person to watch the news, it usually means taken out, right? So um, they were both uh, sound asleep with the news going on, and I decided I would get busy doing their taxes. I was their IT person, as anybody in midlife knows taking care of older parents. You become their IT genius, and uh, I decided to sit down at their computer there in the den as the news was on and start getting their taxes done. Um, as I was working on their taxes, I suddenly saw a black hooded figure walk through the door of the den. And I very calmly looked up from the computer and knew that it was death. It was death black hood, very kind of hologrammy, shimmery, not defined, you know, kind of thing, smoky almost kind of 
death standing there, sickle in hand. And I looked at him and he nodded to me. And I looked at my parents, dad was sleeping on the couch, mom was in her easy chair. And I said, which one are you here for? And just at that moment, the minute I asked death who he was here for, the buzzer rang for the timer for the pie, the, the apple pie that we had put in the oven. And so I got up and mom kind of roused out of a very deep sleep and said, oh, the pie. And I went to her and I grabbed her hand and I said, don't worry, mama, I got it. You just rest and, and sleep. And I kissed her on her forehead. And just as I was getting the pie out of the oven, a big commotion was going on in the den. And I put the pie down and raced back into the den and mother was in cardiac arrest. And she was straining to breathe. <gasps> and she saw me run up to her and she threw her whole body in front of me and I caught her. And as I caught her, her spirit rushed through me and death was still standing there right behind me and he caught her like a football caught her spirit like a football and they whooshed out the window and I saw all of this in my mind's eye when I say I saw this happen many people have been asking me what is it what does it look like what does it look like and it's more like a hologramic image I, I liken it I had a book as a child and the book had a, a, a picture book, and then it had a cellophane uh, page that you could layer images on top of the picture so that you could layer other images as you folded the cellophane pages over it. That's kind of how the experience is with this mystical seeing when I say I saw death. It's like a layer on top of everything that we see around us. There's another layer on top of that. And death caught my mother's spirit as she went through me. I could feel her go through me. And they went out the door and I was holding her physical body that was still fighting to breathe and looking into her eyes and she was not there anymore. And I knew that she was, she was on her way. And of course we're panicked and freaked out. These are shocking you know, experiences when somebody suddenly dies. And we called 911 and my father came and held my mother and I'm rushing back and forth trying to unlock the door and making sure that the ambulance can find us. And I run out to the street and flag the ambulance down and run in. And they start doing CPR and all of the things that they're supposed to do. That's what they do when you call 911. They're there to help save the person. And I knew she was already gone. And my mother also had severe spinal injuries and had had several spinal surgeries. And it was very troubling to see them pounding on her chest, knowing that at any moment she could be paralyzed if she did wake up. Oh my goodness, I was hoping she didn't because that, that would have been awful. And we get to the emergency room. My neighbor drove me, my dad ran, rode in the ambulance and get to the emergency room and they wheel her out and they're still doing the compressions as she's riding on the gurney. And she just looked like an image that I had seen so many times before at the Browning Library at Baylor University. They have a Browning Library for Robert Browning and Elizabeth Browning. And in the main foyer, when I was at college at Baylor, they had a very large, larger than life painting that their son had painted. And it was a picture of a woman who had fainted on a couch with her arm out and an incubus was resting on her chest, just kind of looking at her, stealing her soul. It's kind of the incubus methodology, the mythology of the incubus. And this big, larger-than-life image. And coincidentally, my mother had been a professor at Baylor and actually worked at the Browning Library and had worked in that very building. And that's how I had seen that painting so many times was visiting my mom while I was a student at Baylor at the Browning Library. And mother looked exactly like that. 
she was leaning, her arm was hanging off the gurney as they were wheeling her in, and she had this man on top of her punching her chest. And I had that image of the incubus, and I knew it didn't matter. Her soul was gone. There was no stealing her soul. She was off. Death had picked her up. Like the UPS man, it wasn't scary. It was actually very beautiful that death had stopped by for her and taken her on with him. A few years later, dad uh, moved into a retirement center for um, Alzheimer's care. And uh, it was a whole different experience, kind of a long walk home for dad and I. And I became his caretaker and learned so many things. Pardon me, I kept emotional talking about my father's journey. It was such a long journey. As anybody who knows, who's had an experience, with dementia and Alzheimer's. Ah, oh, the tragedy of uh, watching your own abilities go. I remember very well, my father loved to swim and they had a lovely pool at his retirement center. And um, we went swimming and he became progressively worse at swimming as you lose, your, you lose all of your abilities. And I had taken him swimming just to try to calm him down. It was just dad and I in the pool and nobody else was there in the afternoon. And dad just tried to swim and couldn't and started crying. He was just on the side of the pool crying. And so I just calmed him down and I was like, dad, let's just float. And I just held him in the water. He was very nervous about putting his head back in the water. Alzheimer's patients very stereotypically don't want to get their head wet and so I held his head and I held his body in the water and we just floated and I talked to him about how when he breathed in his chest would rise and when he breathed out he would sink into my hands and I had him I got him dad I got you dad and I just held him in the water and he knew that he had lost that ability it was just tragic the knowing that you're losing the abilities is the hard part about Alzheimer's. Well, in 2020, we all know what happened with the pandemic, and I was no longer able to go into the facility and visit with him physically. We would have little window visits. I think I have a picture of our window visits. And uh, yes, we would visit in the window. There's dad and I visiting through the window because I could not go in and see him. And it was tragic, as anybody knows, um, living through that time, having a relative in a retirement facility, um, the overwhelming cut off from all the people, the physical hugs and things that they were missing. And daddy didn't last long in that environment, in that situation. And he um, was on hospice care. He was in and out of the hospital. And when he was in the hospital, I would stay in the hospital 24 seven and be with him. Hospitals are horrible places for dementia patients there so out of their element and they don't know what's going on and it would throw him into severe um, panic attacks and, and upsetting situations. And so I would stay with him and he was in and out of the hospital that whole year and um, we were on hospice care and that's where I learned about hospice care and um, the great needs for hospice care and how important it is, but it's not what everybody thinks. Oh, you get on hospice care and you have a nurse there 24 seven there to take care of you. No, it's not that. It is uh, having a hospice nurse that comes maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. And then you have to rely on your own caregivers and hiring a full-time caregiver and 
the family being full-time caregivers to bathe and to help them to the restroom and to help um, hold their dignity. Ugh, you lose Oof. so many dignities as your body and your mind breaks down. Uh, forgive me for becoming emotional, but it is such a tragedy to watch your loved one go through those experiences. But I'm so very glad that I did because now I know, I know how hard that is. And I know the lessons that my father taught me about that dying experience. He had such a lovely attitude towards losing his memory. Oh, forgive me, folks. I'm sorry. It's very, ooh, so hard, but I want to tell you about the lovely attitude my father had. Because he got to where he couldn't remember anybody. He did always remember me. He always knew who I was, and that was a blessing. That was God's blessing, that he always knew that uh, I was Martha and I was his daughter. But he didn't really know who anybody else was. And so he told me, Again, he knew he was losing his memory, and he knew that this was happening to him. <sighs> and so he told me, because I don't know who anybody is, I'm going to treat everybody as family. And whoever he came across, from the cleaning lady who would clean his room, to strangers who would be touring the facility, to all of his physical therapist and uh, mental therapist and the caregivers that he had and the lunch ladies that he dealt with. He just treated everybody like family and he would treat them just like his daughters or his sons. And it was a beautiful, oh, sorry, Daddy, <laughs> help me Ooh, tell your story because it was beautiful. But in that year, he suffered severe cardiac arrest. And because he's on hospice, in the hospice care, you normally have a book. And on the book that all the hospice nurses who come in and out will log their progress with the patient and you always have your DNR, your do not resuscitate information right there in the folder. Well, dad had gotten to be very sly and clever about hiding things. I do not know how he knew that was the one paper <laughs> that we really would gonna need, <laughs> but he hid his DNR uh, and they could not find it. And I could not enter the building to look for it because it was COVID. And so the emergency medical team had to take him. They had to uh, take him to the hospital and perform CPR and all of those things that he had not wanted. But they didn't have the DNR, so they had to. It actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise because then I was able to go to the emergency room and be there with him in his final moments. And in his final moments um, of being intubated and they give you the medicine that paralyzes the body when they intubate. And by the time I got there, they had already done that. And I was calling, trying to get them to fax the DNR from the residential center and we were waiting. And as we were waiting, Dad became conscious for just maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. It wasn't long, but he opened his eyes and his eyes were terrified because, of course, he had all these tubes in him and it was very frightening. And he knew he was dying. And I'm so, so thankful that I was right there and that I could get into his face and just hold him and tell him, Daddy, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to go see Jesus. You're, this is the biggest adventure that life has to offer, Daddy. You're going to go on such a great adventure here. You're going to go home to God. And you're going to go see Mom. And when you find Mom, tell Mom I miss her. And it's okay to let go, Daddy. It's okay to let go. I'm going to be fine. 
I'm, I'm here. I had called my friend who was an ER nurse to come with me to the hospital. She was there. Ricky was able to put her hand on Dad's shoulder and let him know, Jerry, I'm here. I'm here with, with Martha. She's not alone. It's okay. And we were able to have that final moment of, of deliverance with my father, and it was so beautiful. So as I was there with my father in his dying process in the emergency room, and he had just woken up and I could tell him that it was okay to let go and that this was the moment he'd been waiting all his life for, was to go see Jesus and go home to God. And I told Daddy, let's pray. And he had kind of drifted back off and lost consciousness after that one to two minute period of, of being lucid. And so I stood over him in the emergency room and I put my hand on his heart and I put my other hand on his third eye, on his forehead, and I prayed. I started praying to Jesus and I closed my eyes and in my mind's eye, I was holding him just like I had held him in that pool that day. I was holding his spirit and we were walking through the blackness of the field of possibility. And I was holding him and praying to Jesus, Lord, please come, this is my father. Please come and take him home to be with the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. Please come, and I prayed that three times, Lord, this is my father, please come and take him home to heaven to be with you and the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. And I just prayed that over and over again. And suddenly, as I opened my eyes, still in the hospital, still with my hand on his heart and on his forehead, again, I saw Jesus come through the wall of the emergency room. As I'm praying, I had opened my eyes and Jesus was coming through the wall with several attendants, several little people, shorter people. I don't know, it's so weird when you see these things. Um, but it was Jesus. And Jesus, by the way, is not white Jesus. Jesus is a, you know, a, a Middle Eastern man with a Jufro and, you know, the whole beautiful kind eyes, brown eyes, and just, you know, it's Jesus, Yeshua. And uh, he came and I said, this is my father, you know, please take him to heaven to be with you. And the Holy Spirit and I said, he's a good man. He's a professor. He helped so many students at Baylor and he's lived his whole life in devotion to you. He was a deacon in the church and a missionary in the Middle East. And he's like done so many things, so many good, so touched so many lives. And, you know, uh, it's a little fucked up, but, you know, aren't we all? And Jesus looked at me and he said, I know, I've got him, don't worry. And they started carrying his soul off through the wall. And just as they were getting to the wall, Jesus looked back at me and he gave me a look and he went like a little nod. I got a little nod from Jesus. And just at that minute, I thought, oh my goodness, I hope that was Jesus. <laughs> was that Jesus? I hope that was Jesus. What's he doing nodding at me? But that was very nice. Very, you know, uh, hey, Martha, I got, I got it. Don't worry. And just then, the paperwork had gone through, and the doctors came in, and they took Dad off of the ventilator and um, pronounced him dead. And so I was able to be there. So grateful. So, so grateful that I was able to be with him in his final moments and to hold him and talk to him and pray with him and see Jesus come and take his spirit away. Again, when I say see, it's very layered. It's a layer of reality that just kind of it really happened in my mind. This happened, but it was a layer on top of the reality situation going on. And as he was declared, uh, dead, uh, calling all the family members and letting everybody know that I was sitting there with him and that he had passed and I was able to thank him uh, for being a good dad and for teaching me so many things and 
um, just be um, thankful for his life and, and, and bringing me <laughs> into this world. And, uh, and it was just such a beautiful, beautiful holy moment. I knew that he was out of his misery. He was out of his pain and he was out of his miserable, tragic situation. So those experiences were where death affected me personally in my life, holding both of my parents as they died, grieving my ex-husband that I had previously hated and letting go of that hate and anger and just wishing him well on his way, on his journey. So death affected me. Death came by and stopped and took my loved ones on. And I was blessed with the sight to see these occurrences happen. And this brings me back around to the docu-series uh, on HBO. I think it's called The End. I need to look that up. Uh, and uh, that I had seen about knowing what to do and how to prepare for death. So when I had moved to Dallas and moved in with my parents, that was one of the things that I said, I'm, I'm moving home and we'll help you, but we're going to get yourself prepared and get all the paperwork done and get your will created and get your um, advance directives uh, done and get all the, you know, we went to the funeral, uh, uh, the memorial place where my grandparents were buried and they bought plots next to my grandparents and had all of it all scheduled. We, we made all of the arrangements in those years before they both died. Um, and I went with them and I was there holding their hands through the whole process. And we made all of the preparations and the arrangements so that in those emotional moments of trying to prepare a funeral and deal with your grief and the trauma that you've just experienced. Preparing a funeral is exhausting and getting all the family members there and scheduling the priest and who's gonna say what and who's gonna sing and all of those things are so taxing that if you prepare beforehand and you kinda know who you want maybe to sing at your funeral and those kind of things, um, it helps the process go so much smoother um, and as kind of their caregiver and the daughter who had moved home I was able to honor their wishes and to honor what they had prepared for themselves in their final moments and that kind of brings me around to talking about how I became a death doula. All of this death experience that I'd had in the years previous. Last year in 2022, I happened to be watching the news. I was watching the PBS News Hour, and there was a segment with Alua Arthur, who is a kind of famous death doula and she was talking about the profession and what it is to be a death doula and what it means to help somebody make those preparations have those hard talks um, buy the funeral plot buy you know get your advance directives together um, hold the space for your loved one as they're dying in that holy holiest of moments when they're dying. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And seeing her talk about it, I was on my couch just watching the news and I saw Alua Arthur speak about death doula and I sat up straight and I was like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I'm supposed to do with my life. That's what I'm here for. That, that's it. I just knew. I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And I got my cell phone out and I started looking up Alua Arthur and I got to her website and I was like, how do we become a death doula? What do I need to do? Oh my goodness. And she had a big, big, uh, you know, seminar series that you could take. And I was like, can I, should I, you know, I just saw this on the news like this. Should I change my whole life just by watching one program? 
so I decided to sleep on it. And that night, as I was sleeping, I had a dream of an old woman came up beside my bed in my lucid dream. It was a very lucid dream. I was very aware and I remembered that this happened. An old woman came up beside my bed and just as I was actually waking up physically, I was kind of in that little dreamy space, of kind of awake and kind of asleep. I heard this old woman say in my ear very clearly, call Shevin. Just like that. Call Shevin. And I woke up, like for real, in real life, woke up with that in my ear, call Shevin. Well, who was Shevin? Shevin was a lady that I met four years previously at a yoga retreat. And we kind of, uh, we both knew, we kind of clocked each other as both being very spiritual uh, people. And um, we had kept in touch loosely over Facebook. Just, you know, you go to a retreat and you friend people on social media and you kind of follow their lives along. But, you know, I hadn't talked to her since that retreat four years ago. So I thought, oh my goodness, am I going to follow this dreams directive and call this lady that I hardly know, that I don't even know if she remembers me. And so I was like, well, you know, when you have a dream like that, either ignore it and go on about your life or you can do something about it so I thought well that was such a weird very realistic dream I'm going to text her so I texted Shevin on Facebook I was weird and I felt awkward and I was like oh, I don't know if you remember me but we met at that yoga retreat and I just had this weird dream and this old woman came up and told me I needed to call you and I don't know why but I'm just putting it out there in case you want to investigate with me. And she immediately responded, Shevin's that kind of person. She immediately responded and was like, oh my gosh, yes, let's get together and, you know, let's go meet up for a cocktail and talk about it and see if we can figure out why you needed to call me. And so we met. I hadn't seen her in four years. Complete stranger, you know, to me. But uh, we met and sat down and she had been studying all of these spiritual things and she was in a study group and she's like maybe you're supposed to join my study group and I was like oh, I mean that's very interesting stuff but that doesn't feel right that doesn't feel like hmm, it's not ringing true we were finished with our cocktails about to pay out and I just kind of decided to tell her about this news report that I'd just seen you know the week before that uh, a little author was talking about this thing called a death doula and I think that's what I'm supposed to be and Shevin went oh Martha that's it that's why you had to call me my best friend just got her certification to be a death doula and I know I can put you in touch with her and she can help you and I went what and we both had goosebumps we were like oh oh my goodness that lady in the dream was pointing me in the right direction to learn more about how to actually become a death doula and so I immediately contacted her friend and her friend pointed me to an online course uh, that you can take to become a death doula and it is called doula givers doula givers.com and it is a training course that trains you uh, in the ability to help people make their arrangements uh, prior to a death experience, trains you to be there as a non-medical per non -medical person in the room, kind of like the person who knows a doula. Uh, let's go back and take a step back and, and just define a doula. So what is a doula? A doula is traditionally uh, the term comes from a Greek term meaning female slave <laughs> um, and uh, kind of progressively through the the years um, it's become uh, a term used for a birthing doula so we've heard about people who have a doula there who help hold the space for the mother 
concentrating on the mother's needs as she's going through the birthing process, making sure she's okay, making sure she's doing her Lamaze breathing, making sure she's got water and ice chips, making sure you massage her back, kind of being the coach, the woman who knows in the room. And the same thing is conversely true for a death doula. You are the person in the room who is a kind of third party who just knows uh, what to do, who can be the link, uh, the liaison between the hospice nurse and the family member who's going through this emotional tragedy. And you can kind of help make sure that that family member knows and remembers what the hospice nurse has trained them about, you know, using mouth swabs when they forget how to swallow and all of these kind of things. You just kind of know and you can help help preserve and hold that space for the dying individual to make sure that they have their dignity and that their wishes, whatever they want their death and their funeral to look like is is carried out uh, with all the family dramas that can happen you make sure that that person has their their wishes and has has the best care and the best you know making sure that they're not in pain and helping make sure that that translates over to the nurses and the caregivers who are there making sure that they get all the pain medications that they need helping just make sure that that person has the best possible death so that's what a death doula is. And when I found somebody who knew how to get in touch with somebody who could point me in the right direction to sign up for the course, I signed up immediately. Uh, it is a, a, a three month course that you can do online. And I scheduled time out of my busy schedule to every uh, twice a week, every week, devote two hours to studying. Uh, learning about all of the major diseases that people die from and how those kind of progressions happen, what to look for, what's the transition phase uh, from, you know, urgent care to serious to you've got 12, you know, weeks to live to maybe you've got 12 hours to live now and kind of knowing what those touch points are. Again, you're kind of just the person who knows who can be in the room and just kind of know that this is the transition and this is what to expect and this is how we help that person along their way in this in this phase. And it is um, a beautiful thing to help people on their journeys and to encourage. It's very, very hard, of, as I've just discussed, it's very, very difficult to be a family member and to see your family member going through the hard transitions that happen in the death process, especially at the end when they forget maybe how to swallow and they maybe forget, um, eventually they forget how to breathe. And just being that person who can know and who can help guide and counsel the family member to remember that auditory is the last sense, all of your five senses, that's the last sense that you lose. And you can still tell that person along their way, even though they might be unconscious, they can still hear you. And you can tell them how much you love them. And just like I did with my father, tell them how much I appreciate everything he did for me. And you can still tell those people along their way. And it's just a lovely, lovely thing to be able to help support people in their dying process, help support family members as they are struggling, and help support and, and be, oh, this sounds weird, but it's almost like being a party planner. It's a joyous, beautiful, holy occurrence when you transition from this life into death. And, um, and helping plan a funeral can be a beautiful thing, can be a loving, caring, beautiful thing, almost like a party planner. Um, and so this is how I kind of came into this profession and how I, I um, met death and, um, and became a death doula. 
I hope that you've enjoyed my storytelling style. Uh, if you are interested in watching more tales of a death doula, I've got a notebook full of topics that we're going to be discussing uh, over the coming uh, weeks and months uh, around death and dying and what it all means and all of the mystical, wonderful life lessons that death can teach us. So please tune in for another episode, and I hope you have a wonderful, blessed day.